Hello everyone. I hope that all of you are fine and enjoying good health. Welcome to the lecture of robotics and automation. My name is Amir Sharif and I shall be teaching you this course. So this course is designed for um, masters in mechatronics. It has three credit hours per week and the course code is NCT-551. So the suggested books that you can follow, um, here are the five books and uh, because this course is already a combination of robotics and automation and these two fields are uh, not really similar so that's why we need multiple books but these are only suggested books you can follow any other any other books you like or any other material from internet YouTube wherever you like so this first book modern robotics mechanics planning and control um, this in this book we shall uh, we shall study some chapters that are related to industrial robots and for the second book introduction to robotics mechanics and control uh, here we again we shall study some chapters that are related to industrial robots their configuration space and some uh, concepts about uh, kinematics and inverse kinematics and the third book is elements of robotics uh, this also here we shall uh, we shall uh, talk about a chapter that is focused about the transformation matrices and and later we shall use these concepts for um, from for kinematic modeling of the robot so these three books they are they will be used for okay let's these three they will be used for purely for robotics and especially industrial robots and then the other two books industrial automation and robotics from this book we shall also grab some concepts about automation and especially the industrial automation and also some basic concepts about ro robotics and the last book industrial communication systems uh, this will be about the communication standards that are being used in the industry for example field bus profi bus so we shall uh, take these concepts from these books again these are only suggested books you are free to follow any material you want okay so um, what is the objective of this course what is the objective of this course robotics and automation of course robotics is already uh, a multi field there are there are multiple fields merged in this one and automation this is also again a broad field so what is the objective of this course this course is actually it is it is intended to give theoretical and industry related knowledge about robotic manipulators and automation so you will get also theoretical knowledge as well as the industry related knowledge that is useful for your future uh, career so you you already know some stuff before entering the practical world students are expected to learn kinematic modeling and programming of industrial robots so this course is specifically designed for industrial robots okay uh, there are also other types of robots 
but this robot is only focused on or mostly focused on industrial robots and we shall learn how to model them and how we can program them for useful tasks and you shall also learn about um, programmable logic controllers so in the second phase in the second uh, part of this course which is automation you will be um, learn some basic concepts and also some in-depth knowledge about programmable logic controllers and their industrial uh, applications at the end we shall also uh, go through various industrial communication methods so quickly just see what are the course contents of this uh, this course so clearly we have divided the course into three parts so the first one is the we there about the industrial robots where we shall cover about uh, the concepts like introduction to robotics and then we shall talk about in detail about the industrial robots their types applications and then we shall talk about configuration space work and envelope coordinate transformations manipulated kinematics like forward kinematics inverse kinematics and I I hope that not if not all of you some of you might have studied um, uh, uh, like or have introduction about these concepts about forward and inward inverse kinematics if you did not already if you don't know about these things uh, then don't worry we shall try to explain it like uh, everyone can understand okay after that we shall um, we shall go through path planning trajectory generation and following industrial robot programming grippers and end effectors robot commissioning and calibration and finally safety and maintenance so this was the first path, uh, part where, where we cover about the robotics especially the industrial robots um, in the second part we have the industrial automation so in this uh, in this part we shall cover we shall have an overview about industrial automation and then we shall go through basic architectures with some examples or case studies uh, we shall talk about programmable logic controllers and how to program them which languages this we shall use and then some uh, input output interfacing visualization and control and finally system development um, in the third part we shall cover the industrial communication so in in the in the uh, communication between different automation devices we need to follow certain protocols or certain method for fast and robust communication so in this part we shall see how we can um, how we can uh, apply existing technologies or methods of communication and which is uh, better for example there are uh, methods like field bus profibus or industrial ethernet and we should go through them and also we shall learn about the advantages and disadvantages of each of the method okay so we have seen the course contents and also the objective of this course so now let's see the introduction so introduction to robotics uh, so first we need to define what is a robot 
Um, the word robot was introduced in 1920 in a play by Karel Kapek called Rosum's Universal Robot. So, yeah, you can see the word was actually introduced long time before and uh, this word comes from a Czech word the word is robota and the meaning of this word is forced labor so in the previous times yeah it, the, the labor uh, it was forced labor was I think it was common because um, because of the slavery and because of uh, lack of human rights or labor rights so forced labor was common so they came up with this machine and they came up with this idea about forced labor by a machine and they use this word which is robota okay so how we define robot in in, in a modern definitions so there are uh, two definitions that I use here um, the first one is a machine capable of carrying out a complex series of actions automatically especially one programmable by a computer so so notice that it's a machine and it it can perform complex actions automatically so this is one part of a robot and the important thing is it must be also program programmable by a computer so the computer must be there also it means that uh, without computer without a programmable computer the machine the automatic machine is not really a robot so this is the one definition um, the second definition is a robot is a computer controlled machine that is programmed to move, manipulate objects and accomplish work while interacting with its environment. So this is a little bit more, um, you can say a specific um, definition toward industrial robots or robotic arms. So here you can see that computer controlled machine there must be a computer and it, there, should, there should be a movement and also a capability to manipulate objects to interact with the with the world and accomplish work so it should be also doing some useful work for humans so if it's not doing something useful so I mean you can call it robot but it's not really uh, it doesn't make any sense if it's not doing any work for us because it's it's uh, for us it's a slave it's a cheap forced labor it's a robot okay so we have seen the definition of robot and so let's see here here we have a, a picture of a rob robotic arm you can also call it a robotic manipulator and what you can see here uh, so the the purpose of this robot is to draw something on the paper so here we have some a microcontroller okay that's a you can call it a programmable computer and then we have some electronic components power supply and the base of this robot and then we have this arm and the arm has here joints so here this is a joint here here is also a joint and then here is one joint also and then finally the end effector is here which is a pencil in this case and then these are the links here that connects two joints um, so according to definition uh, this uh, this robot can perform complex actions automatically 
if it's programmed by this microcontroller or, or a tiny computer, it can draw something by itself. And it, it's also, it can do something useful also for us, for humans. Okay. Maybe it can draw our picture if it's properly programmed. It can manipulate objects. For example, it can hold this pencil and also move it and draw something on the paper. So this is this is a example of a robot or specifically a robotic arm. We have seen the robot now. Now you're studying mechatronics, you're doing masters in mechatronics. So I'm quite sure that you're familiar with the definition of mechatronics, but let's repeat it. Let's see what it says. So what is mechatronics? Synergistic integration of mechanical engineering, electronics, electrical engineering with intelligent computer control in the design and manufacturing in the design and manufacture of industrial products. So, so this you call mechatronics. It's a combination of, of different fields, mechanical, electrical, computer. And what you do, you, try, you manufacture some industrial products and also you design some industrial products um, using all, using this integrated knowledge. So this you call mechatronics. This field you call mechatronics. Now we shall see what is robotics and how it is related to mechatronics. How it's, what are the differences, what are the similarities. So robotics is a branch of engineering that involves the design, manufacture and operation of robots. So in robotics what we do, we design, manufacture and operate robots. In the mechatronics, we design, manufacture industrial products. But here, see that you can clearly see that robotics is a subfield of mechatronics. How it is subfield? Because here it's more generalized. It's industrial products or you can say just some some items that you design and manufacture. But robotics is specifically related to robots. The machines that have a computer controlled controller and they can manipulate, they can move and they can also do some useful work. So this is the difference between mechatronics and robotics. Okay, since our course is robotics and automation, so we have to also, we have to know what is automation. We will not, not go in depth here. Uh, we shall only see its definition, but in the second part, we shall go in detail about automation. So what is industrial automation? Industrial automation is a use of control systems such as computers, robots, and information technologies for handling different processes in an industry to replace a human being. So what we do here in the automation, um, we use control system, we can use microcontrollers, computers, robots, PLCs, uh, and what's the purpose of this is for handling different processes. For example, if there is a packaging plant, if there is a milk packaging plant and we want to automate it, we want to, um, we want that uh, all the packaging or the processing should be done automatically without the involvement of humans. So, so the use of all these technologies to automate some process is called industrial automation. So 
Now I hope that you understood the, the definitions and the differences between uh, different uh, terms that we use. Uh, let's see this figure here. Uh, what you can say is this um, is this a mechatronics device is this a robot industrial robot what can you tell about this figure okay so this is a mobile robot mobile robot because it has wheels here and also it has some sensors attached for example this is the IR sensor for obstacle detection and on the top we have some microcontrollers and power supply so you can you can call it as a, a mechatronic system and specifically you can you should call it a, a robotic system okay of course because robotics is a subfield of mechatronics so this is our robot, robot, specifically a mobile robot. So it's a robotic system and also it's a mechatronic system. But there are systems, for example, uh, traffic light. Have you seen our traffic light? Using, uh, using let's say, um, microcontroller so this system that uses some you that uses a predefined on off sequence of lights after a certain amount of time the the red light turns on and then the green light turns on so what do you say is this uh, what kind of system is this so is this a mechatronic system or robotic system since we have for the we have defined for for the robot we have defined that a robot is a machine so there is there should be some movement involved some manipulation of objects in involved and uh, so but here this in the and also here while interacting with its environment so there is there also should be some interaction with the environment but here if you see the traffic light traffic light has a let's say a microcontroller and there is there is no sensor involved here there is no movement involved here so we can we cannot call it a robotic system so this is example of a mechatronic system but it's not a robotic system okay so it means that uh, every robotic system is a mechatronic system but every mechatronic system is not necessarily a robotic system you can come up with other examples also think about other examples that are the systems that are mechatronic system but they are not robotic system okay so now you know about what is a robot what is robotics um, and now it's time to see what types of robots are there so generally speaking there are two main categories of the robots the first one is the mobile robots as the name suggests a mobile robot is a type of robot that has ability of locomotion so what is locomotion Mo locomotion is the ability to move from one place to another place literally the whole robot including the base so 
see here I didn't use the word movement or motion okay locomotion is different than simple motion for example I can move my arm this is a motion of my arm but locomotion is actually moving my whole body from one place to another place not moving my leg or my feet or my arm so it means that a mobile robot must be capable of locomotion displacement you can call it from position 1 to position 2 or location 1 to location 2 um, so the, here in this figure this is an example of a mobile robot you can see it has four wheels and some electronic and computer system for control and it can move around it can move around from positions to position so this is a perfect example of a mobile robot now let's see the second type of the robot which is industrial robot so industrial robots um, the name says that it's industrial but it's not necessarily that they are only limited to industries you can use it anywhere but the main difference is that these robots can move are capable of motion but they are not capable of locomotion so let's see the definition industrial robot is defined as a number of rigid links connected by joints of different types that are controlled and monitored by computer this is typical uh, definition of industrial robot so you will see some uh, let's see this uh, this figure you will see here are some joints where it can move and also there are some links for example this is a link here this again there is a joint here and it can rotate here and then again there is a link and then also it can do motion here and then again link and then motion here so it's a it's a connection of links and joints and here we have the base you can call it and it must be controlled by computer programmable computer so the difference between mobile robot and industrial robot is that the industrial robot can can have motion or move motion for example the, this arm can move there are, of course there are motors here the joints can move it can have any configurations like up and down or it can rotate also so it can have motion but it cannot have locomotion no no locomotion the base cannot move cannot change its position in any axis but for a mobile robot it's different okay so our this course will be mostly related to industrial robots we shall go in depth of industrial robots their their modeling and the terms related to this but we, we we shall not go in depth of mobile robots because this is not the scope of this course but you should have some basic idea about the mobile robots and this is not the only type of mobile robot so you should see a robot and you should be able to tell what kind of robot is this so certainly there are other types of mobile robots let's uh, let's pause this industrial robot here and we shall now see what are other types of mobile robots so So let's see this is the first this is a one of the type and this is the one other type and finally this is third type 
So this one is we call it Omniwheel. Omniwheel robot. So this is also a type of mobile robot. It has wheels, four wheels just like a car and actually not a car but it has four wheels that that have motors attached to it so the difference is that between between uh, this robot this mobile robot and this here this omniwheel robot is that this omniwheel robot can instantaneously change the direction of motion but this one here it cannot let's say if it's moving in forward here and suddenly you want to move it in this direction let's say this was the x-axis and this is the y-axis and you want your robot to move along y-axis while it was already moving here along the x-axis it cannot it needs some time so first you can do the robot will stop it will rotate in this direction and then it will start moving here or it will slowly it will take some time to change that direction if it's if it don't stop completely but in case of omniwheel robots this is not the case it can instantaneously change its direction of motion if it's moving forward along x-axis and what you want to do you you want to now move it along y-axis so it can do it instantaneously just need to uh, change the speed of the or the direction of motion of the wheels and it will move like in any direction along x and y axis okay then we have uh, here the differential drive robot this is another type of mobile robot Uh, so so how it turns is that when it's moving forward now it wants to turn along the y-axis here so what it will do it will change the relative speeds of the two wheels this is the wheel here and what it does that this wheel will start moving slower than the other wheel and then it slowly turns in this direction and it will change in its direction and start moving along y-axis so you can call it it's similar like this is also a differential drive robot um, this is also a differential drive robot but the difference is that this one has four wheels and this one has only two wheels and one passive wheel for support maybe on the back side or in, in the front side here it has a passive wheel to support because the robot cannot be stable on two wheels okay unless it's it's a self balancing kind of robot so normally if it's not a self balancing robot then it cannot be stable on two wheels it must need a third wheel for support for stability okay let's see now the third type of configuration of the wheels that we can have in a mobile robot which is a car like robot so this is again an example of a mobile robot it's a car like robot the wheels are arranged like a car the wheels of the car so this steering the turning mechanism which is attached to the front wheels it's called Ackermann steering okay and and the, the the rear wheels they have the differential drive okay so the advantage of this thing is that um, during turning during turning there will be and no there will be less slipping okay but the other kinds of robots for example this differential drive they they might face some slipping problems especially at high speed turning 
uh, this is not really a good idea differential drive so that's why most of the cars they have this Ackermann steering and differential drive um, so that they can turn at high speeds without slipping or without uh, getting unstable so this is we call it car like robot and this is again an example of mobile robot huh. so the mobile robots are not only limited to wheels nowadays you will find some drones and this is also a type of mobile robot the drones how they work they they have four propellers powered by motors and um, they uh, they produce a thrust downward and which in turn uh, lift the robot upward okay and how this when the robot want to move forward so what it does it decreases the speed of the it increases the speed of the the rear two propellers and in this way it will start moving forward and similarly it can change directions it can move in any direction just by changing the relative speed of the propellers nowadays as the sensor are becoming cheaper and lightweight and uh, power efficient so these drones are becoming more and more autonomous so they have GPS sensors they have obstacle detection capability also um, and different types of gyroscopes and accelerometers so they are getting more and more autonomous so this is also a good example of a mobile robot Uh, then we have some mobile robots that look like they have legs and they are inspired from animals for example in this picture we have a robot with four legs and this is used for some kind of transportation of goods but I guess it's for military purposes and yeah so this is also an example of a mobile robot uh, so finally we have two more categories of robots that they are not mobile robots actually um, you can you they actually they can um, they have a, a capability of locomotion but we call it humanoid robots we don't call it like industrial robots or mobile robots we name them humanoid so uh, this for example this one is from Honda Asimo and it has um, it's a self balancing robot just like humans it can balance on on two legs and also they are making it more intelligent and especially they are these kinds of robots they are being designed for the for social interaction and for personal use for assistance okay they're not suitable for really suitable for industry um, but they are more suitable for social interactions where close interaction with humans is desired um, so one more type of robot these are called soft robot so of course they are not mobile robot okay this is also another different category of robot um, so they are they have some soft materials for example silicon or some some other type of plastic or rubber and uh, but they are not made of some some stiff or metallic material so you can compare this thing uh, this for example uh, this um, gripper you can call it with an elephant trunk 
So the elephant trunk, it's soft. It's not really hard. There is no bone, bone inside it, okay? And meanwhile, it can do task, for example, picking, placing, and also it can manipulate objects, uh, but there is no bone inside it. So there is no bone inside it. It means it's less stiff. It's not that hard. So it means that it can be uh, used in places where uh, less risk is required, less, uh, you can say, accidental risk is required. So the elephant trunk will damage less. For example, if a human is get struck by an elephant trunk, there will be less damage as compared to if the human is struck by some kind of metallic KUKA robot. So there is there is more damage because it's hard, it's tough. So uh, this field is a newly uh, soft robotics. It's a new field. They're working on it to develop some different mechanisms of actuation using some pressurized air and or fluid to expand contract these uh, these kind of uh, actuators you, you can see in this figure so they are pressurizing it with air or some kind of fluid and you can see various movements they can control it so I've seen also some of these soft robots where it can pick and place some objects or manipulate some objects. Okay, so this was a brief introduction about different types of robots. Um, we have seen mobile robots and two other categories and one category which is industrial robots that we will continue in detail. So what are some, some, uh, some terms that we shall use in this course? You must know that. I hope that you are familiar with most of these definitions, but it's, it's good you just revise them, okay? So links and joints. Links are the solid structural members of a robot, and joints are the movable couplings between them. So this is a base of a robot, let's say. And then you have here a joint. And then you have here a link. So this is a joint here and a link here. And then you have again one joint and one more link here. So you can call it link one, link two, and this is joint one and this is joint two. So these are the links and joints. And if we combine them together, we can make a robotic arm or you can, enter, uh, you can call it also robotic manipulator. The second is degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom is the number of independent movements a robot can realize with respect to its base. So independent movement, for example, if there is two links are connected by uh, one joint. So let's say this is a fixed, fixed link, and then here is a joint, and this is link one, and this is link two. So here, because this is, if this is a joint that allows rotation about one axis okay so it means that this link which is L2 the link L2 can have uh, one independent motion about uh, let's say this is the z axis here 
about z axis the link to can have a circular motion okay circular movement so you can call it um, it has one degree of freedom because it cannot move there is no translation involved it cannot move along x y axis it cannot move um, it cannot rotate also about x y axis it can only have one motion which is the rotation about the z axis so this is the degree of freedom of this specific uh, arrangement of the links the second thing is the third thing is the accuracy accuracy describes how close the arm will be when it moves to the desired point so let's say your robotic arm um, your robot the end effector of your robot end effector means the, the the tool that you have attached here for example this was a, your tool link robot and here you have attached a, let's say a paint brush for painting okay let's say this is a paint brush um, so this paint brush is the end effector okay so you want your paint brush to be at position let's say uh, at x axis it's uh, 2 and at y axis it's let's say also 2 but in reality it goes in the x axis like uh, 2 but in the y axis it goes like 1 so it means that it's not really accurate so this is the draw it here with the different color so actually it's here somewhere let's say here so the green one is your desired position and red one is your actual position of your end effector so it means that your uh, the your robot is not accurate it has a low accuracy now comes precision precision is defined as how accurately a specified point can be reached this is a function of resolution of the actuator as well as its feedback devices so for the for the precision we mean that uh, how close are the if, for example in let's take the same example this is your desired point but uh, let's say your robot uh, first time it reaches here very accurately near to the your desired point but second time it's not really good third time it's somewhere here fourth time here so, so it means that your the it means that different every each time it, ha it has uh, error and the, the output is not consistent okay every time it has different uh, position it reaches different position sometimes it's accurate sometimes it's not okay so it means that this robot is you can call it it's precise within the uh, with a specific error sorry uh, it's accurate within a specific error but it's not precise okay then comes the work envelope a robot can only work in the area in which it can move this area is called the work envelope so every robot it can reach a specific region of the space near around it and we call it work envelope the work envelope is determined by how far the robot's arm can reach and how flexible the robot is the more reach and flexibility a robot has larger the work envelope will be so 
if a robot if, if your robot is like uh, let's say a one link robot attach this is a one link robot we have here there's one joint and one link so so its work envelope will be something like this here So the robot can reach in this region of space. Um, no, we not not the end. So it will be limited. Let's say within this region, the robot can reach and it can perform some task. For example, painting, welding but within this region so this is its work envelope it cannot move in the other direction because we assume that it's not allowed here because of the fixed joint okay so another thing is we call it stability stability refers to robot motion with the least amount of oscillation now this is very important for example most of time we are concerned about the position control of the end effector when, whenever we have a robot we are doing something like for example welding let's say we are doing welding with this robot here and what we are doing is we are we want actual sorry accurate position control we want the position to be accurate here okay but if the position control is not stable and the robot is shaking and uh, not really maintaining its position and there are some oscillations then there there are some stability problems so if the robot is stable okay it means that its position control is very good and there are no oscillations so it, we call it the robot is very stable and it's a good quality of a robot um, next thing is speed speed refers either to the maximum velocity that is achievable by the tool center point or by individual joints so the speed is how fast the joints or the the tool center point is moving and um, this is also very useful property because Sometimes we need uh, we need this uh, desired speed, especially when your your uh, your object is moving and the robot must move with the object. Then you need uh, accurate speed control. So, yeah. Another thing is payload. Payload is the weight. A robot can carry and still remains within its specifications reach is the maximum okay this is reach is the okay payload is the weight of a robot can carry and still remain within its specifications so um, here you see that um, within its specification when a robot lifts a payload payload means a weight so whenever a robot lifts a weight for example a car okay or some some part of your of a car and so robot should be uh, should able to carry this weight and also it should maintain the specification of position control like it should maintain its uh, position with a good within a, within a good uh, you can say uh, range of position it should not become unstable you know while not starting to oscillate or shake so this maximum load or the, this maximum weight we call it uh, payload 
that the robot can carry and this is also very important especially when we are we want to select the robot later you will see that this is also important for example when your owner says that find a robot that can do this this and this and it must have also a payload capacity of let's say uh, 100 kilograms so then you have to either design a robot or you have to purchase a robot that can carry 100 kilograms without shaking or without consuming extra power I mean extra means without uh, extra means the power that can overload your circuit okay um, one more definition is the reach reach is the maximum distance a robot can reach within its work envelope so in this case uh, you can say when there is a let's say a two this is a joint this is a robot and it's a, this is a link one of the robot and this is a link two and this is here we, we, there's an end effector here some kind of tool let's say drilling a drill so what is the reach of this this robot here so the maximum distance that it can reach starting from your base this is the base the fixed one the maximum distance is when this uh, this link will move like here it will get straight like this and this will be true so you can call it and this maximum distance is the reach of your robot so of course when this link will turn from here to here okay so but this is the maximum distance this is the radius you can call it this is the reach okay but the last concept is a settling time so what is the settling time I hope that uh, some of you have already studied it in your control system during a movement the robot moves fast but as the robot approaches the final position it slows down and slowly approaches at final position the settling time is a time required for the robot to be within a given distance from the final position so uh, so what happens that the robot when it, it moves to position 1, let's say position 1 to position 2. So what happens is that it, uh, it moves fast and then when it reaches near the position 2, it started to slow down. Okay. Um, so it, it's not like instantaneous break, otherwise if you if you uh, stop it like very quickly it will be a cause a jerk and then the the load the object that is car uh, that is attached to the robot there is a chance that it may get damaged so what it does it try to slows down and then finally stop at the final position so the time it takes uh, to slow down okay we 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 call it settling time and if you remember from control system let's say this was a position this is a final position and it was something like there were some oscillations and finally the oscillation is gone and then your there was some steady state error but your robot was finally at your final uh, position position which is the position 2 so this time in which the the robot still uh, 
still trying to stop and getting closer to the final position uh, this we call it settling time okay so now I we are um, we are familiar with the basic concepts and basic terms used in robotics so let's move and see what else um, what else things we need for for robotics to start with so now uh, we are from here we are specifically talking about the robotic manipulator or you can call it robotic uh, sorry the industrial robots so here we shall talk about types of joints of the industrial robots um, a robot joint is a mechanism that permits relative movement between parts of the robot arm again when there are two links one is fixed and then here we have a joint that can that allows rotation and then there is a second joint so this is link one this is link two this is joint so what is the joint is uh, the joint allows a relative motion between movement between link one and link two in this case it's a circular motion so we call it a robot joint J is a robot joint there are basically uh, five types of five major types of uh, robotic joints actually there are more but here we are discussing only the uh, commonly used or the important ones so the first one is prismatic joint prismatic joints are also known as sliding as well as linear joints they are called prismatic because the cross section of the joint is considered as a generalized prism they permit link links to make a linear displacement along fixed axis in other words one link slides on the other along the straight line these joints are used in gantry cylindrical or similar joint configurations so what is uh, imagine a, so a prismatic joint imagine you can say a some kind of a rod okay a rod that is square shaped but hollow from inside so this is here is, here is a material it's a metallic rod let's say okay but from inside it's hollow and then now imagine one more rod that's also a square shaped okay but it can slide inside this red color rod okay so this rod this uh, square shape rod one it can enter in this red color hollow rod 2 so the movement will be the movement movement will be like in this direction okay let me change the color so the, the movement of this rod will be either in this direction or in this direction so let's say this is x-axis so it means that the rod this green rod can enter in this um, this red color hollow um, link you can call it and it can also come out but it cannot rotate in any because it's a square shape okay it's fixed within this 
uh, within this uh, red color rod so it cannot rotate it cannot move in any other axis the only axis it can move is along x axis so we call it prismatic joint so this joint is a prismatic joint and it's it allows only linear displacement okay let me they permit links to make a linear displacement along fixed axis yeah so that's we have already explained here and they say that these kinds of joints are used in uh, gantry or cylindrical um, so later when we study the different types of of the industrial robots then we shall see what where we use these prismatic joints so how many degrees of freedom this uh, this kind of joint has only one let me write down here degrees of freedom one for prismatic joints and only linear motion then we have revolute joints the second type of joint is a revolute joint where a pair of links rotates about a fixed axis so we have already given the example here so for the revolute joint uh, let's see can we move it from here to here or let's draw I think better draw one here okay so for a revol let's draw the revolute joint we have here a fixed link and then a knot here and then a joint that allows rotation and then we have one more link here attached with this so this link this link to and rotate because here we have a joint that allows circular motion it cannot have any linear motion because the joint is revolute joint it only allows rotation along Z axis or any axis so it means that this type of joint which is a revolute joint it has a degree of freedom of one degree of freedom because there is only rotation along by one axis there is no displacement so degree of freedom is one I think this is the most common type of joints for, for robots okay the third types of joints are cylindrical joints uh, cylindrical joints they are they look like similar to the uh, to the prismatic joints but the difference is that here we have the so here, here we have instead of a square uh, rod we have a circular rod hollow circular hollow rod okay it doesn't look like proper rod maybe I should so this is this rod is hollow from inside 
okay and let's assume another link which is a rod which is not a hollow rod but a rod that enters that can enter inside this rod here so in this case we have two rods rod 1 is a solid rod and rod 2 is the hollow rod but they are circular they look like you can imagine same like here prismatic joints case and here we have a square shaped okay both the rod 1 and rod 2 but here for cylindrical joints as the name suggests here the cases both are circular okay so in this case there will be one motion will be along so that this rod green rod can move along x-axis like in and out this rod can go inside and then come out so one motion will be along x-axis and the second motion that it can also rotate about one axis so let's say the, the rotation is about also x-axis so it means this kind of robot, this kind of uh, joint, it has degrees of freedom 2 because it can have two independent motions. One is translation and the other is rotation. But in case of prismatic joint, it cannot rotate because, because it's, it's square shape, it's constrained, it's, it's fixed there. But here it can rotate, it can also displace. So these are cylindrical joints. And now let's move toward the uh, universal joints. So in case of universal joints, we have, uh, it looks like something like this here. Um, as you can see that this is, let's say one of them is fixed. This is the fixed link here. And then this is a movable link. So this is the joint. You can see these two links. This link one. And this is link two here. And then here we have a joint. So it allows us the motion along the rotational motion. Along let's say here along one axis. In Like here okay let me draw again and also it can rotate about this axis also so there will be two rotations okay if you move this you can you can see an animation also just google it and see the animation um, so there will be one rotation about this end effector will move like here and second will be it can move along this axis rotate so there will be two rotations two rotations it means degree of freedom this degree of freedom is two here we have how many here we have one, one linear motion and one rotation. And here we have one rotation. But here we have only one. linear motion okay so universal joints they have two degrees of freedom but they can only have rotation no translation or no linear motion one more important one is the uh, spherical joints 
the spherical joint looks like here in this figure you can call it this one is your fixed frame here this is the base the fixed frame and this is your uh, end effector the position that's movable the movable frame here so yeah so for the spherical joints what kind of motion it can have this this point can move along let's say if this is x-axis and this is y-axis this is z-axis x y and z so this this type of joint it can uh, let me just this type of joint it can um, rotate about x-axis of course like this in either direction it can also rotate about y-axis like in this direction and it can also rotate about z-axis let's see how like in this direction so you can see that uh, one rotation is about x-axis this red color one this is red color rotation is about x-axis it will move like this and this and the second rotation is about y-axis this blue color one so it can move like this and here and the third rotation is about z-axis it's a it's a rotation about its uh, central axis so it means uh, it has three rotations so its degree of freedom is three so we have covered the some of important joints that are used in industrial robots and now it will be for you easier to uh, understand further about industrial robots okay so the next thing is types of industrial robots so we have studied different types of joints and now we shall see that how these joints are used to in different types of robots so I have chosen here four different types of industrial robots and the first one is the Cartesian robot and then we have articulated robot Scala robot and finally we have Delta robot there are uh, one or two more but they're not that popular they're not that common so let's start with Cartesian robots so um, here you can see in the figure we have an example of a Cartesian robot so um, it usually has three prismatic or linear joints so it means that um, one joint let's say for rotation for uh, for uh, movement along x-axis and then we have one joint for movement along the y-axis and then finally one joint we have movement uh, along the z-axis so this is we, we can call it this is a fixed joint here and then so this is x-axis y-axis and z-axis and finally you have here somewhere uh, your your end effector or your tool so as there are three linear joints involved so there will be only linear motion the robot can move here and here and then it can move uh, these links can move up and down so the so similar it's shown here like in this figure this end effector this tool 
it can move like in this direction which is let's say this is x direction and then there will be uh, a more frame that supports its motion along this axis also which is y axis and it can also move up down a little bit so you can call this axis as z axis a perfect example would be a 3d printer have you ever seen a 3d printer so this is uh, one of the example of cartesian robots they are also sometimes called gantry robots and one more important thing is that for cartesian robots they have rectangular workspace so if you see their workspace it will look like rectangular in shape Okay, it, it's not as rectangular as I wanted to. So let's make again. So yeah, this is much better. So its workspace is rectangular. So the tool can move anywhere in within this region of area and it can perform so here you can see the workspace will be uh, entire this region so this is in 3d yeah okay so this was one of the advantage and write it here okay uh, before writing let's see that its applications what applications we have uh, pick and place this is the one of the application the, where the robot just have to pick an object from one place and then and then put it somewhere else uh, application of sealant assembly operations and arc welding so these types of applications you can use this robot and what are the advantages one of the advantages is that it has high stiffness and better payload capacity because this type of robot the end effector is supported by overhead frames along x y axis and so this robot is very stiff which is useful to carry heavy loads if the frame is heavy then you can also carry heavy loads so this this is one of the i think the good the main advantage of these kinds of robot that is that it has a better payload capacity and then we have the second advantage is that easy computation and programming so because only linear motions are involved okay so this robot is easy to you can compute the position of your end effector um, easily as compared to the the robots which involve some rotational or revolute joints then you have to calculate angles and they have to use trigonometry uh, that will be a little bit difficult but here only linear motions are involved so this is relatively easier to uh, compute the positions and also do its programming so again it has the advantage is it has most rigid, rigid structure for given length um, since its structure is rigid so it means that 
and there will be less shaking also it means that these types of robots are accurate okay um, other types of robots where the structure is not that rigid they will not that precise or accurate okay there will be some backlash between the joints but in here in this case the structure is rigid so they are more accurate and precise now let's see its disadvantages one of the disadvantages is that it requires large operating volume because linear motions are involved so of course you need have some kind of frame for these linear motions and this requires a lot of space so this robot is not suitable for where you need where you have a less space okay the second disadvantage is that exposed guiding surfaces require covering in corrosive or dust environment so especially the in, in industry you have sometimes the environment is very rough a lot of dust or some materials coming out and so these types of robot the problem is that it's difficult to see their uh, their their surfaces or you can say the area where they move okay so for example this here um, uh, this is the let's say the end effector that has to move along this slide overhead slider so if there is a dust here then uh, you cannot really cover this area the dust will stick here and then when this uh, end effector will reach here it will collect this dust okay so that's a problem with these kind of robots you cannot really cover and seal the joints and the surfaces so yeah this is one of the problem and with time this problem will cause uh, trouble because it will affect its accuracy precision and also the velocity of this uh, end effector so this was Cartesian robot its applications and so I will go for it for if I let's say uh, the one of one of the uh, advantage that I will choose is that if you need a better payload capacity then I will select this kind of robot but <clears throat> for the selection there is uh, in the next slide we will see there is also some selection criteria and we shall again discuss this thing there so meanwhile let's see articulated robot which is a second type of industrial robot they are also called uh, robotic arms because they look like robotic arm as you can see in the figure they are also called 6x6 robot or sometimes they are also called robotic manipulators so these are different names of the same thing here so this is a figure here you can see these kind of robot they have uh, a revolute joint so let's see in this figure where are the revolute joints located this is the fixed base here and then this is our first joint this is a revolute joint and this is a second joint again a revolute joint and then here we have one more revolute joint and here one more revolute joint here and then we have revolute joint here and finally here one two three four five six so we have six revolute joints and then finally here we have the end effector or gripper so the connection between two revolute joints this is a link so 
this is first link here second link third fourth five fifth link so notice that the uh, it has six revolute joints so it has um, six degrees of freedom okay most common type of industrial robots so these types of robots they are commonly used so mostly when you see in industry especially in the automobile industry you will see these types of robots and why because we, sh we shall see some its advantages um, they have six axis of motions or six degrees of freedom and I already showed you why, be why? because we have the uh, six revolution joints so that's why they have six degrees of freedom they resemble to human arm yes we have also uh, they look like human arm and at the end we have gripper so you can compare them with you can do same task as we do with human arm and most joints are revolute joints yeah so we have already covered so let's see its applications so they are suitable for assembly operations where you have to assemble some products for example your assembly of your automobile parts where you have to gather some parts and place them together they are application applicable for die casting fettling machines gas welding this is also very common application of these types of robots arc welding spray printing yes this is also so these three applications are much common and in industry also they are very commonly used industrial processes so what are the advantages of these types of robot so they have high mechanical flexibility this is one of the advantage so they are flexible and if they are flexible it means that they can reach the places where other robots cannot reach for example uh, this Cartesian robot it cannot drill a hole in the wall for example here if you see here we have a let's say this wall on the back side if you want to drill a hole with this uh, Cartesian robot it cannot do that because it's it has limited degrees of freedom and also it has fixed orientation which is always pointing downward so its workspace does not allow to uh, to, to drill holes on angle in angle or with a tilt but with this type of robot since it's flexible it has more degrees of freedom so it can reach uh, any almost any uh, position in its workspace okay and also because of this it's uh, it can perform multiple tasks like not which other robots cannot do I, I gave you example already about this um, drilling a hole horizontally so this robot can easily do this task but others they they may not the next advantage is that all joints can be sealed from the environment you see as you have seen here the the joints they can be easily sealed because they are they are rotary joints and they are also small they are not that uh, long not that big so they can be sealed and covered from the dust and the particles which which increases its uh, its life and also requires uh, less maintenance so these were the advantages now see let's see the disadvantages um, so the disadvantages include uh, they are slow because too many joints and many parameters to control of course there are if there are six joints it means there are six actuators six uh, motors that need to be controlled so which makes this robot a little bit slower than 
than the uh, your Cartesian robot. So Cartesian robot is actually fast. Did we write down here fast advantage? I think it's not mentioned here, but we can write down that this is fast comparatively. As compared to articulated robot, your Cartesian robot is fast. And the reason is less degrees of freedom, less, less actuators to control, and also motions are straight also. But here we have more degrees of freedom, more joints needed to be controlled, so which makes it a little bit slower. Or you can call it comparatively slower. Another dis disadvantage is that it's difficult to visualize, control, and program. Again, if you want to uh, visualize your end effector to be at a certain position, and what is the configuration of this uh, robot with respect to this new position, it's difficult to visualize. And also, the um, it requires a lot of mathematical computation to to uh, to control this robot, and also which makes the programming also difficult. And then we have low accuracy. Uh, this is it depends upon, but generally speaking, it has low is at less accuracy because there are many joints involved and if we add up the the backlash or the error between for each joint so it accumulates and the error then becomes larger and that's why these types of robot they have comparatively less accuracy and precision again the last disadvantage is it has limited payload capacity. So why they have limited payload capacity? Because, uh, because of their, their structure. They have to actually lift the weight without any overhead support. Unlike Cartesian robots, which has a uh, structural support from overhead, okay, these robots they don't have this kind of facility. So, uh, and also you can see that most of there are many actuators that are added with this arm, and they also increase its weight. So if you want to make this robot stiff, okay. You have to uh, use some thick material as a link, and which will in, which will increase the weight of your robotic arm. And if your robotic arm is already heavy, then it will not able to lift uh, much payload here because it's already heavy because of actuators and strong links. So this kind of problem. Um, it uh, it affects its payload capacity, and that's why we usually use these kind of robots for for small to middle range of payload. So here we have an example where there is a assembly line for automobile manufacturing. And you can see there are different types of articulated robots that are being used for different types of operations, including assembly, welding, and then painting. So what's happening is that this car will keep moving, and then each robot will do its operation, assembling, welding, and then finally in the next stage, <clears throat> maybe they do some kind of painting and so eventually at the end of this conveyor this assembly line the there will be a, a finished car 
and this is an example of uh, industrial robots and automation also so because it uses very less human intervention okay so the next type of robot we're gonna study is the SCARA robot <clears throat> so SCARA robots stand for selective compliance assembly robotic arm as you can see in this figure this is a SCARA robot it has two revolute joints and one prismatic joint so this is one revolute joint here one revolute joint and this is the second revolute joint here and then here we have a third prismatic joint that allows linear motion along z-axis it is faster than the articulated robot because it has less joints so I think this is the advantage so let's put it here okay before going to advantage let's see the applications where we can use this robot so it's commonly used for pick and place applications for example here you have to pick these objects and place in the other uh, area so this is perfect suited for these kind of applications because this is only a repeatable application you have to do every time same task also assembly operations and then applications of sealant handling machine tools but I would say this is the uh, most common application of these types of robots and let's see the advantages um, it is faster than articulated robots because it has less joints so as you have less joints you have less motors to control which makes this robot faster than articulated robots so wherever you need faster operations you can use this robot another advantage of this robot is that it is easy to program again the reason is that it has a, a a certain structure it's uh, the structure is that it has limit it has less joints and also the the movements are all also very predictable so that's why you can visualize easily you can control it with A's and also programming will be also easy now let's see disadvantages it has limited applications because it's not that flexible okay it's not that flexible because again it has limited degrees of freedom it cannot drill a hole in a wall I mean uh, in a horizontal because its tool or its end effector is always pointing downward so another disadvantage is that okay this is the same thing may not reach in all places so, okay this is one of uh, I think important thing to consider as a disadvantage that it has limited payload capacity so again similar like articulated robots this robot can also have a limited payload capacity because again there is no structure overhead to support the load actually all the load must be supported by these joints and again the problem arises that if you try to make the joint stronger and stiffer then you have to use heavy material and which in turn you have to use heavy uh, motors actuators which in turn makes everything I mean heavy and at the end 
you cannot really lift heavy load with this kind of robot so these kinds of robot they are better suited for uh, small weight applications or where you have to operate small um, stuff small parts need to be picked picked and placed yeah so let's move toward our next robot which is a delta robot so delta robot they have actually three developed joints as you can see in this figure um, so here we have one rebel joint here uh, these are actually these are the actuators the motors here one two and three and they have here a revolute joint here revolute joint here or oh. and then here one two and three revolute joints and then we have six spherical joints we already studied about in the previous slide about the spherical joints and revolve joints so spheric uh, revolve joints have one degree of freedom and spherical joints have three degrees of freedom so here we have uh, this one is a spherical joint and here we have revolute joint So this motor when moves. Um, so one, two, three, three motors. It means we have three spherical joints, three revolute joints, and then we have here also three spherical joints. So it means that now we have six spherical joints and three revolute joints, and so. Yeah, and this on the outer side we have a structure, a frame to support the weight. And here we have the end effector. So one more thing for these kind of robot is that they have a spherical workspace. So their workspace looks like a sphere. Imagine a 3D. 3D sphere, so it will it can operate within a spherical workspace, a spherical region of space. Um, a very interesting thing about this robot is that the end effector here, it can only have linear motions. It cannot turn, it cannot tilt but it can only have it can move, move along x-axis y-axis or z-axis but in a linear way it cannot have any rotation uh, this is because of the, the how this robot is configured and how it is uh, the structure of the robot it does not allow any rotations of the end effector Okay, now let's quickly see its applications. Its applications in include manufacturing electronics, medical and pharmaceutical industry. And due to their stiffness, they are used in surgery also. So these, they are very stiff. Uh, it means that it doesn't allow any uh, small motions without without moving the actuators so they are very stiff if the actuator is not moving so it means that the end effector will also will not move even the small tiny motion will not be there so that's what we required in the medical surgery for example you are operating something you cannot allow your robot to move around and even for very tiny motions so they are used for surgery 
they are used in packaging and sorting this is also a very important application and their advantages are they are fast because motors are attached to the base and not on the end effector which makes the links lightweight and easy to move yes they this is one of the very important advantage of these kinds of robot and also it um, it's unique and makes this robot particularly applicable for high-speed tasks so the thing is your motors they are attached with a frame on the on the top of of this supported frame but your links and the end effector they have very less weight because here the joints they don't have any motors here so you can use here very uh, thin joints sorry thin links and joints and which in turn will decrease the inertia and increase the speed and acceleration of your uh, end effector so these types of robots they are suitable for very high speed pick and place packaging uh, types of tasks especially for uh, for the manufacturing of your smartphones or in industrial some electronic manufacturing so they can be very fast even faster than your <coughs> other three robots Cartesian robots or articulated robots or the uh, Scala robot they are much faster So let's see their disadvantages. These types of robot must be mounted on overhead, which requires a structural frame for support. Okay, yeah, that makes sense, and that's true for Cartesian robots also. Uh, but for here, we we need a different types of of uh, support, and yeah, this structure must be very strong and without any uh you can say without any flexibility they must the structure must be very stiff to support the all the weights of your of the robot and so i think that's why this kind of robot they they have a little bit larger area because of this this structure supportive structure The second disadvantage is that they have less accuracy than SCARA and Cartesian robots. Um, okay, now you are familiar with all the uh, four types of industrial robots that are commonly used in industry. And uh, in the next slide, we shall see that when we have to select a robot, for example, if your boss asks you to, to design a robot for a specific task or to purchase a robot for a specific task, so what parameters or what characteristics should you uh, consider? So we have already studied about the advantages and disadvantages and their applications of different industrial robots. So now it should be easier for you to select a robot for your particular application. So selection of your industrial robot, how you can select. So once application is selected, a suitable robot should be chosen from the many commercial robots available in the market. The characteristics of robots generally considered in a selection process include so what things you can consider the first thing is size size of your work envelope so first thing you once you have application chosen let's say so then you can you have to consider what is the size of your a work envelope 
So uh, first you need to, to consider the maximum dimension of your work envelope. How big is it? What is the size? Uh, typically the uh, Cartesian robots they are suitable for um, for large work envelope and the if your if the size of your works uh, envelope is small then you can either use uh, scala robot or you can also use the articulated robot of course here you need to consider also some other factors also because here we have already defined that the application we have already selected we know the application and let's say the application we are going to select the robot for is pick and place so for this application we are we shall consider some other characteristics of the robot so we have a size of robot and then once we have selected uh, considered the size then we have to go for orientation so what is orientation orientation depends on how the robot is mounted and how it handles parts or products being moved so uh, this is also very important because uh, it it's, it, it depends upon the space you have there and also the type of operation you're gonna uh, perform on the products for example if the pick and place is <clears throat> just uh, like on a table you have pick you have to pick from one place and to put the these ta these um, these objects to another place but they are always uh, on the same plane then you can go for scara robot or you can also go for cartesian robot but if this is not the case and you have to for example you have to pick some objects here let me for example if the application demands something like you have to pick an object from here and then you have to place it somewhere like here so from this plane to this plane you have to so this is your first position this is second position in this case here this was the first position this was the second position of an object So this this is the first case this is the second case so in this case you have when you have something like orientation of your uh, of your work is something you have to move your objects from this orientation to a different orientation so in this case you cannot really use Scala robot or Cartesian robot or even the Delta robot for this uh, types of orientation you have to use articulated robot okay and also you need to consider how the the robot should be orientation of the robot should be if you have like uh, overhead support okay 
for example you have something to support the robot from top then better go for Cartesian robots or Delta robot but if you don't have this overhead support then you get then you need a ground support and for that you need SCARA or articulated robot the next thing you have to consider is the degrees of freedom the cost of the robot increases with number of degrees of freedom and this is because there will be more joints more actuators and six degrees of freedom is suitable for most works so if you are uh, again if your operation or your task requires less degrees of freedom then you go for SCARA robot or Cartesian robot but if your task is more flexible I mean you have you have to use your robot for multiple tasks and they they are also like not limited to uh, a certain plane then you have to choose for articulated robot so it again these degrees of freedom is purely dependent upon your task what you are going to do and then comes the velocity um, velocity consideration is affected by robots arm structure so um, when you have for example you in some application page you need the high velocity and then if you need let's say high velocity or pick pick and place uh, then go for your first my pre first pre preference will be Delta robot and then number two will be Cartesian robot and your if your velocity requirement is low Then I will go for SCARA or articulated. Okay, the next is the drive type. So the type of powering mechanism used in the robot, you have to consider if you want to buy a robot or design a robot what types of um, powering mechanism is there hydraulic electric pneumatic so each one have their own advantages and disadvantages so you need to be aware of this beforehand and based on that you can select a proper robot so some some robots they use hydraulics some use electric some use pneumatic so based on some other parameters like how much noise is being generated how much power is being transmitted and uh, uh, how much uh, I mean how much a distance you gonna operate this robot so you need to consider these also while selecting the robot most of time it's most of time they are uh, electric or hydraulic so the last one is the payload capacity which is the maximum load or weight that can be carried by the robot so regarding payload capacity um, if you have high high payload then you will select this 
Cartesian robot because again they have we have studied in their advantages that they have overhead support so they can lift very high weights and if you have small payload then go for either SCARA or articulated okay so yeah this is how we're gonna select the robot and for this particular let's say pick and place application if you have um, if let's say the size of your workspace is larger then I will select with respect to size I shall select Cartesian robot and then orientation let's say if the orientation uh, of the end effector only requires horizontal uh, or in a planar motion then I will select here again Cartesian robot and if the degrees of freedom of the robot the uh, the operation does not require any tilt okay then here again I will select I shall select the Cartesian robot and let's say the velocity if the velocity is the uh, velocity let's say we need high velocity again you can either here select Delta or Cartesian robot so I will go for Cartesian robot and drive type I shall go with electric electric drives <clears throat> and then finally the payload capacity if the payload capacity is high then again I shall go with Cartesian robot so this is my preferences but depending upon these characteristics you can uh, change it you can do comparison and you can select maybe a better robot depending upon your requirements so this is how we select the robot and the next thing is we now to consider some general advantages and disadvantages of robots and why we should use robot because in the in the industry there are already people working on the same task especially in Pakistan people are working for uh, some assembly operations welding and when you go to your boss and tell them I want a robot and then you have he will ask you why tell me some advantages or why should I choose a robot and so that's why you should be <clears throat> able to tell why what are the advantages and also honestly you have to tell the disadvantages also so the boss should be aware of also the disadvantages so let's see one by one all the advantages first increase in productivity safety efficiency quality and consistency of the product with the use of robots so this is one of the advantage you have more productivity more safety and the quality of your product will be also better because uh, robots are more accurate efficient so this is one of the advantage and then we have robots can work in as it does environments without the need for life support comfort or concern about safety um, so humans on the other hand they need some rest or you can say they need some break within the uh, within the work sessions so for in case of robots you don't need these kind of supportive measures for for, in, for working so uh, this is also one of one of the selling point of robots the third one is robots need no environmental comfort such as lighting air conditioning ventilation and noise protection so all the 
things that are must for human working condition they they are not necessarily needed for robots they can work in dark without any light like without air conditioning or proper ventilation and also they no, don't need any noise protection to cover like for humans you need to cover your ears so that they don't get damaged permanently for robots you don't need that next is the robot can work continuously without experiencing fatigue or boredom do not have hangovers and need no medical insurance or vacation so again it's a, it's a comparison with humans and this is the selling point this is a benefit of a robot they got, don't get tired or bored and they don't need any medical insurance robots have repeatable precision at all times unless something happens to them or unless they wear out so unlike humans robots are very precise and accurate because they are machines but humans on the other hand they are not unless you have very long experience doing something so humans have are not that precise so he this is also one of the advantage if you compare robot with humans robots can be much more accurate than humans yeah because they are machines they have this negative feedback loop and so that is why they they are much more accurate on the other hand humans they they are more like flexible good at multitasking but for accuracy no maybe you need a lot many years of experience to achieve accuracy that is comparable to robots now let's be honest and tell your boss some disadvantages of robot so the first disadvantage is that robots replace human work workers creating economic problems such as loss of salaries and social problems such as dissatisfaction and resentment among workers so this is happening right now in many of the developed countries and in also countries like that are developing they will also face this problems they have a huge population and already less job market so if we introduce the robots there then people will be jobless so this is a fear okay this is a fear maybe they get a job for making the robot that that also need to be considered but the direct effect of robots in industry is that they will replace human beings so that is a fear and this will create social and economic problems the second disadvantage is that robots lack capability to respond in emergencies unless the situation is predicted and the response is included in the system safety measures are needed to ensure that they do not injure operators and machines working with them so robots are if you compare them with humans they are not intelligent they are not aware of what they are doing wrong or when something unpredictable happens how they should respond so this is a problem with robots and this is a serious problem they can damage and they don't know how to respond in some unpredictable situations the third disadvantage is that robots are costly due to initial cost of equipment installation cost need to be need for training and need for programming so your boss must be aware of this thing initially he need to invest a lot of money because all these robots are manufactured in the west and they have a very high prices for for them and also then you need installation cost to install the robot transportation cost then you need to train your workers and also you need to 
for operation and maintenance that's another thing I think that cost is less but initial training cost will be higher so these are some advantages and disadvantages of the robot and now we shall move toward the safety so when you're working in an industrial environment where there are a lot of industrial robots so of course you need to know and consider safety as we have seen in the disadvantages of the robots that they are not that intelligent and they can cause problems because of that safety problems so safety is everyone's responsibility that needs to be clear it's it's everyone's responsibility you cannot only blame the robot the present day industrial robot is a dumb okay they cannot uh, they are not intelligent they cannot think all the possible scenarios where they can hurt someone therefore safety in, in robotics must be managed by humans so this thing is clear that humans should do this safety work in matters of robot safety the safety of humans should come first then the safety of the robot and finally the safety of other related equipment so you, you need to you need to make a priority first safety of humans then safety of robot and then the other equipment around if you are in industry working there so first human safety it does not matter how expensive the robot is if something goes wrong first human must be uh, protected okay and then the robot especially in the west in the developed countries this is they follow this rule very clearly and very openly again I'm saying it doesn't matter how costly the robot is humans are more costly they are more important okay so the next point says that both workers and visitors need to be protected from robots robots can injure people in many ways either through bodily impact or by pinning the human against the against some structure okay so in the in industry there are workers that, that are working with the robot and then there are some visitors that that visit the your company or your industry and they they can visit for many purposes okay just to uh, see how their order is being executed or maybe they want to purchase a similar robot like this so so the safety from the safety perspective both these workers and visitors need to be protected okay and because the robot can if things goes wrong the robot can uh, hit hit this uh, human or also they can just push uh, push a human against the wall so it can injure human beings the most dangerous situation in which human must work with the robot is when repairing it The next most dangerous situation in which a human must work with a robot is during the robot's training or programming. The least dangerous situation in which humans must work with a robot is during the robot's normal operation. So now we are talking about the when humans are working side by side with robots. Okay, again they can be workers or they can also be visitors that came to repair or program the robot they don't work in your industry but they came from outside from the robot manufacturing company and they want to uh, do some repair or maintenance the first danger scenario is when the robot is being repaired okay this is the danger scenario so in this scenario there are chances that there is some 
external visitor there and you want to repair the robot in this condition the robot will behave very unpredictably okay, it's already damaged so it can cause some more damage to humans also so this condition this situation is very dangerous and it demands more safety and the second condition where uh, the human must work with the robot during training or programming uh, so this is also because humans at this stage uh, both the human and the pro uh, and the robot they are not uh, being expert of their or they are not fully in a fully functional state for example while programming the robot the code might not be uh, perfect and during, during training humans also don't know before that uh, how the robot gonna move or behave so this is also a dangerous situation but it is, it is categorized as less dangerous than the previous one the least dangerous situation is when the robot is working normally it's perfectly programmed and it's doing its normal operations and then humans have to work there so this is less dangerous because things are already in a flow and there are less chances of getting some kind of damage okay unintended operation can result in injury for example a robot's arm functioned erratically during a programming sequence and struck the operator struck the operator so it can happen that when humans are working there so unintentionally what happens that uh, our, our robot arm uh, can accidentally or unintentionally hit the uh, hit the human so this is un this was not intended at all but it was a mistake let's say a bug in your program or there was some fault next point is a material handling robot operator entered a robot work envelope during operations and was pinned between the back end of the robot and safety pole so this is another scenario where things can go wrong so so this person it entered the work envelope during operation and there, there can be multiple reasons for that why he entered um, <clears throat> but the robot will just push this person with the ball and it causes this accident Another scenario is that a fellow employee accidentally tripped the power switch which a maintenance worker was servicing and an assembly robot. While a maintenance worker was servicing an assembly robot. Um, this is also a very dangerous scenario and I am I am also a witness of these kinds of situations it happened one time and I'm I'm personal witness it was not a robot but it was just an electric heater and someone was someone was repairing it and this guy's mother came and she doesn't know that he's repairing this electric heater in the kitchen but she came in the house from outside and she turned on the main switch electric switch and that guy got literally shocked because he was holding the wires so coming to, uh, toward the um, this scenario so the robot's arm struck the maintenance worker hand because someone accidentally switched on the power supply so this is also one scenario where people can get hurt there, there is a chance of accident so let's see what causes robot accidents. 
the first cause is placing oneself in hazardous positions while programming or performing maintenance within the robot's work envelope. So, can it happen in a in a developed in a developed industry where the protocols are being followed? So during programming, what happens or performing maintenance? Um, it can happen sometimes during programming or when you are repairing the robot. Um, while you are focused on programming and repairing, so sometimes unintentionally humans they enter the danger zone. Okay, and this can cause accident. So if you are especially uh, repairing or maintenance, there is a maintenance operation, then you need to be careful that you have, to, you must have to follow the safety protocols. The second cause is entering the envelope because of unfamiliarity with the safeguards in the place or not knowing if they are activated. So especially for newcomers, the fresh graduates, this is also, this can happen because they are not, uh, aware of the signs and safety uh, signals not fully aware so what happens that they they might learn by experience so here in for example in the developed countries there is a special course on safety learning about the signs and safety protocols before entering these kinds of environment. The third cause is making errors in programming, interfacing peripheral equipment and connecting input output sensors. So this is also if there is a mistake during these operations then this can cause accidents. And in the programming it happens. It can happen more often than you think. The fourth reason is mechanical failure. For example, if the gear is broken, suddenly broken, okay, so it might happen that the link or the robot arm suddenly fell down, and if there is a, some human there, it will get struck. Number five is safety guards deactivated. So during maintenance or repairing, sometimes uh, people turn off the safety guards and then they forgot to turn them on again human error so this can cause accidents then we have hazards from pneumatic hydraulic or electrical power that can result from malfunction of control or transmission elements of the robots power system such as control wheel voltage variations or voltage transients disrupting the electrical signals to the control and power supply lines. So this is also, I would say, uh, it can happen also more often than you think, especially the countries where there are uh, fluctuation in the voltage or power supply. Uh, it can also cause serious accidents. And the last one is electrical shock and release of stored energy from accumulating devices that can result in injury to personnel. Uh, Sometimes it can happen that the wire is broken and it is it touched the metallic body of the robot and then a human unknowingly unintentionally touched this wire of the robot body and he got shocked. So this can happen also. So this can also cause robot accidents. Okay, now let's see how we can prevent the accidents. To prevent hazards to the system, the robot systems operator should ensure that all appropriate safeguards are established for all robot operations. So this is important that the operator should ensure uh, that all the safety measures are 
and all the protocols are being followed. So sometimes um, we think that okay or the, the operator think that it's not really important or we can skip this uh, small safety protocol but it turns out sometimes it's risky it's very risky those small safety measures even the tiny red lights for indicating the danger zone sometimes if they are ignored or they are not turned on they can result in serious accidents so the first thing is you need to follow the robot manual whatever there are safety instructions are written you need to follow them you need to properly step by step you need to follow all the safety protocols all workers should be educated about the safety issues involved in working with robots or other equipment so this is also not only the robot operator but also the other people who are working there in the, in the industry they must be given a crash course about safety and how they can prevent accidents and this can only the education of the people will ensure that there will be less accidents so this is education is very important when arc welding robots are used shields or curtain should be placed around the welding area to protect passerby from bright light of the arc whenever repair personnel works with a live robot they should know the location of the nearest emergency stop button so one thing is uh, it is suggested to make a uh, some kind of fence near the around the, the work envelope of the robot and also there uh, the people should be properly uh, trained to that if in, in case if something happens so beside education they must have training so they can respond quickly to this uh, emergency situation and prevent accidents personnel should be safeguarded from hazards associated with the restricted envelope through the use of safeguard devices so safeguard devices can be any a mechanical fence around the work envelope of the of your robot or it can be also some kind of indicating signs of danger or it could be some red lights that indicate that this place is not allowed to visit so that the common workers they can avoid the danger zone and also then they can prevent accidents to happen so this lecture will end here thank you very much for joining if you have any questions you can contact me by email i shall provide you guys the email also and if you still have some like technical questions you can also arrange uh, a meeting on the zoom where you can talk with me and also uh, have a live discussion of or a question answer session so thank you very much and goodbye